Okay, so what I want to talk about in this video is an interview that Anita Sarkeesian gave recently with Jessica Valenti. I've got to mention a few things about Jessica Valenti in due course that featured in The Guardian and Guardian Online. I don't particularly want to talk about the central thesis, if you like, of that interview, which is the trolling thing. I will mention the trolling and the abuse, uh, but a few sort of side issues that spin out from that. But before I talk, and by the way, hence the plaid shirt, right, I thought I'd get into that kind of uh, Anita Sarkeesian vibe. And to be fair, I only had two plaid shirts. It was this one, the other one, and I was kind of mortified that it was still in my wardrobe, had one of those integral t-shirts in it. I, I've consigned it now to my decorating clothes box, so that's kind of sorted. So hence the shirt. But within about three hours prior to recording this, it'll be several days ago now, Anita Sarkeesian released her latest uh tropes series video and i'm not going to discuss that video here uh, because i haven't had a chance to watch it at least i've all had chance to digest it but i will say a couple of things about it which is that if you're going to watch that video i suggest try and separate whatever views you have on anita sarkeesian anita sarkeesian's politics and her socio-politics from the arguments that she makes Pick, don't bundle all the arguments that she makes together. Pick apart each one separately and then see how each one works with you. That is what I have done in the past. And although there are many things that she said that I've disagreed with, there are things that, I, that she has said that I have agreed with. And in fact, when I've talked to some people online, I've mentioned some of those arguments after they've talked about the Miss Mail video, for example. And then when they've gone, they've gone back. A couple of people have done this, gone back and watched it and then said, yeah, actually, yeah, I think you're probably right. She does have a point with regard to that. So I would suggest that. But at the same time, right, this is a real bugbear of mine. If anybody says to you, I don't know what the problem you have with people like Anita Sarkeesian is, because it's not as if they're trying to ban anything. Take something sharp, right? Something at least as sharp as this pen, and then fucking poke them right in the eyeball, right? Because if there's one thing that gets my goat, it is this. These same people who have said that, right? If you were discussing slut shaming or fat shaming, right? They would roundly be criticizing people for that. They would be decrying those activities, even though nobody's trying to ban anybody from wearing slutty clothing. Nobody said we need to make it a, we need to make it an offense worth five years in prison to get so fucking morbidly obese that all you can do is shovel food down your face and shit and piss the mattress right nobody's trying to ban those things but what they are doing is trying to make people feel guilty trying to shame people for being like that for doing those things they are trying to make those things culturally unacceptable and I think that is what Anita Sarkeesian and Macintosh and all that crew are trying to do here they are trying to make these things culturally unacceptable if that if that isn't a if, if that is something that is worthy of criticism in other spheres then why is it something that you can't take umbrage with here as well that's all i want to say on the video because what i want to talk about then is this interview with jessica valenti that took place in the guardian so the guardian article was entitled uh, the word troll feels too childish this is abuse and one of the first tweets that came out was from somebody this guy who said something along the lines of oh now q i'll stream uh, videos on youtube from people showing outrage i wouldn't want to disappoint that chap so this is my contribution towards that but it's a really interesting situation when you actually have stronger feelings towards the interviewer than towards the interviewee so i should say something about jessica valenti who was conducting the interview and she is a perennial if she doesn't class as somebody who is a sexist in her own way then I, I really don't know what sexism is she was one of the people who was mortally offended last season with game of thrones she'd sat through the whole lot she'd seen the bodies mount up she'd seen the killing she'd seen the mutilation she'd seen the brutality she'd seen the disembowelment she'd seen the humiliation she'd seen the mass slaughter she'd seen the whole lot in every graphic detail she'd seen the mountain sticking his thumbs in somebody's eye sockets and tearing their skull open while they're still alive she'd watched theon great joy 
be tortured for almost an entire series. She'd watched Theon Greatjoy have his penis chopped off and then sent in a box to his fucking family as part of that torture. But when the same person, the same character who carried out that torture then raped uh, Theon Greatjoy's half-sister Sansa Stark, then all Jessica Valenti do, could do was to sit there on top of the mountain of corpses that she's observed and said, I'm done. Done with rape as a plot device. Done with, the sh done with this show. Because then, then it had suddenly gone too far. My word, they'd shown a main character being raped. How could they show something as extreme as that? Jessica Valenti is one of these people whose mission, it would seem is to unearth and highlight prejudice in society but strangely enough her writings seem to demonstrate her own prejudices more than they highlight the prejudices of anybody else so it was jessica valenti carrying out the interview and it is jessica valenti's hyperbolic spin that has motivated me to record this video right at the beginning before we even get into the main uh, passage of, of the interview and then later in the interview itself she says the same thing when anita sarkeesian launched a youtube series on misogyny in video games. Now, I was never sold that this is what Anita series was about, that it was about the way in which video games systematically demonstrate hatred or a severe dislike towards women as a class of people. I was never told that. What I was told is that this was an open-minded inquiry. Who knows where it may lead towards the way in which women have been represented within video games. But it turns out that that's not the case, or at least it's not the case according to Jessica Valenti. Now it could be that this is simply her hyperbolic spin and this is something that Anita Sarkeesian would take objection to. In actual fact, the Guardian and Jessica Valenti both tweeted a piece uh, advertising this interview that had been made. Anita Sarkeesian has retweeted those, but at no point has she corrected and said, hang on, steady on, my series isn't a look into the hatred uh, towards women in video games. Now, that's, that's kind of a little bit misrepresentation of what the series is about. So I can only assume that she condones this kind of use of language and it's this kind of use of language that really irks me and the reason that it irks me is because it is a very very manipulative trick and what it consists of is taking a word that means something very very nasty such as misogyny which means a hatred or dislike of women and using it to mean something way way less than that and one of the things that they tend to use this particular word for is to mean something akin to mild sexism and if you don't believe me well let me play you a clip now of Kate Brooks talking at the Oxford Union and the rest of this video by the way I'll link you to it, but I'm going to be doing a video discussing uh, some of the rest of this video uh, that will probably come out in, uh, in a few days' time or a week's time or something like that. But for now, just let me play you a little clip of Kate Brooks and you'll see what I mean. Because we think the voice of ethnic minorities and women is more important than the right of these men to be misogynistic and racist. That's something we incredibly stand for on our side. Okay, so you're not a sexist. So lads mags aren't sexist. You see what happens there? Kate Brooks was in no doubt. She talks about misogyny and then when she's questioned on it, she says, oh, so you're saying you're not a sexist. The way that she uses it, the way that she defines it, they are one and the same thing. They are just interchangeable terms to be used, but they are not interchangeable terms. They do not mean the same thing. And misogyny in most people's minds is something far, far worse than his sexism and this is why this is such a shitty little manipulative trick that is taking place here and I'm not the only person by the way to pick up on this when the uh, Australian leader of the opposition accused the Prime Minister there of being uh, a misogynist the Guardian asked six well-known feminists whether they regarded misogyny as the same thing as sexism and they all said roundly no it isn't one of them specifically said i'll show you some of the comments here one of them specifically said misogyny is something much darker and much deeper so it's a pretty serious accusation to level when you use the word 
misogyny. And the trick that's being played here is something I've talked about in the past, something that I call smearing through equivocation by proxy, which sounds a bit of a mouthful, but what I'm trying to say by that is by smearing, what I mean is that you're trying to unfairly associate somebody with something negative to smear them. Okay, equivocation, we understand what equivocation means when you switch, you have two separate definitions, two word definitions that mean something substantially different with regard to a term and that you're switching between the two, but it's equivocation by proxy. You can stand back and say, oh no, I'm being consistent in the definition that I'm using, but, but you're using a proxy because the proxy is the other person, the proxy is the listener, the proxy is the reader. They are operating to a very different definition than you are well aware of that. You're very well aware of what is going on. So you can stand behind your definition knowing well aware that some equivocation going on because the people that are reading it are working to a different definition to the, defin to the definition that you use. Hey, I could talk about it. I could do it in this video, couldn't I, with Anita Sarkeesian and start talking about Anita Sarkeesian as a paedophile. Now, all I mean as a paedophile, all I mean is she has an affinity for children. Nothing sexual at all. I'm just saying that she's great with children. She's great around children. She loves children, but nothing sexual, nothing negative. And I'm just saying that Anita Sarkeesian's a paedophile. But I know full well that when I do that, that the people who are listening to the video would understand that word to mean something way, way, way worse than what I'm claiming by it. And this is this business of smearing through equivocation by proxy and it is a really 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 shit trick manipulative trick to play and it is one that is done and it just irks me every single time that I read it and it is yet another example of conversational gerrymandering which is a kind of linguistic land grab. So even when nothing's going on, you've redefined these terms in a kind of asymmetrical way. So it looks as if something's going on. So it looks as if in some way you or your chosen cause celeb has been persecuted in some way, even when nothing of the sort has gone on. And if you don't believe that that happens in this way, just look at the way these people use the word misandry and the way in which which they expect the word misandry to be used, which isn't just anything that any situation that slightly disfavours men in some kind of way. They'd laugh you out the fucking room if you did that. Misandry still firmly means to them and has to mean absolute hatred and vitriol aimed at men and towards men as an absolute group. And if that is not the case, then you shouldn't be using that term. That's the only way in which that term is acceptable. But the word misogyny is taken on this kind of holistic approach now so that you can just throw the fucking word around like some kind of verbal confetti, scattering it on anybody that you don't like. After all, if you go back to video games, take an example from video games, 90% of the people that are shot through the face have their brains blown out, have arrows put through the side of their skulls, right, are hacked to death with machetes, blown up in a thousand different digital ways, are male-bodied characters. But if anybody was suggest that that was misandric, that video games on the back of that are misandric, they'd be laughed out the fucking room, and quite rightly so, because we still stick to the original definition, don't we? That's part of the conversational gerrymandering. We stick to the original definition with words like that, because we're trying to skew the dialogue in one particular definition. And yet these people, it's just really strange the issue that they have with violence in video games. Butcher, baker, candlestick maker, tinker, tailor, soldier, sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, they all fucking fall alike in video games. It's the world of fucking carnage. It's the world of death. It's the world of destruction. It's the world of violence, 99.9% .9 of which is resolutely non-sexual. Yet when one sexualized woman befalls the same fate, then the fucking sky's falling in, then all hell is going to take place, isn't it? Because let's be honest, right, this is the argument that's being made here, which is that you can play Grand Theft Auto 5 and kill a thousand cops, right? You can kill 10,000 cops, you can set out on a mission to see how many cops that you can gun down while they're doing their duty, while they're doing the job that they're paid to do, which is to keep people safe on the streets. You can gun them down in the thousands 
And that's not a problem. That's not going to influence anybody's behavior. That's not, there's nothing sinister about that. And yet if you run over one prostitute, apparently that's going to lead to something terrible. Something so terrible that stores in Australia ban the video game on the back of it. That people like Jessica Valenti and Anita Sarkeesian are up in arms about it. Because, hey, if people can act like that and get away with it towards sexualized women in video games, that in some ways it is going to inform either their behavior or their feelings towards sexualized women perhaps sex workers etc in real life that there is this kind of spillover but what about the spillover towards these other categories of people what about the spillover towards police officers or soldiers so what is the argument here why are they being treated so badly by the likes of Anita Sarkeesian is it because Anita Sarkeesian doesn't see past the uniform she doesn't see the person behind the uniform effectively she just objectifies police officers as just kind of law enforcement machines rather than seeing them as actual people who are conducting a job who go home to wives and kids or husbands and kids and families and it's only really she only really fleshes out people when they are sexualized or when they're in particular contexts or perhaps when they are female bodied individuals i don't know i don't know what the differential is but it seems very very stark the difference in treatment and it seems very very stark that the whole conversation that is taking place uh, with regards to violence here seems to be involving like 0.1 percent of the violence that's actually taking place within the video games even though seemingly the same arguments would apply to all of it let's forget about 99.9% .9 of it and just concern ourselves with this tiny underrepresented part of violence within video games that involves a sexual element to it or involves sexualized women because something I've remarked on many many times before that when it comes to sexual violence in video games when it comes to sex and the portrayal of sex in a non-violent context in video games the most remarkable thing by a mile within video games is how underrepresented those two things are. You are a thousand times more likely to see somebody get their brains blown out with a shotgun in a video game than you are to see a couple of people having sex, which is which is the absolute opposite of what happens in the real world. You are a thousand times more likely to see an act of non-sexual violence within a video game than you are an act of sexual violence. And yet you would think when you look at the narrative that's taking place that it's all about sex and it's all about sexual violence. When the notable thing in these games is just they are notable by their very absence now what's the whole troll stroke abusers thing which is what this uh, article was in the main about is not what motivated me to make this video i think it would be remiss of me not to make a few comments with regard to this what i want to say first is is to just talk about the inevitability of this and that is not to condone it or justify it there are many things which are inevitable and unavoidable that is not the same as condoning it but i made a blog piece a while ago 18 months two years ago i'll link to it if i remember to put the link in called the inevitability of trolling and it's why all kinds of people it's why justin bieber gets so much fucking attack he gets 10,000 10, times the abuse than anita sarkeesian gets why because he's more famous than anita sarkeesian and he polarizes people if you have some fame and you really polarize people you will get it maybe women tend to get it disproportionately more that may well be the case but it's the simple fact that you cannot then infer something about an entire community based on this kind of thing why because of the maths involved the time i wrote that blog piece uh nita sarkeesian's latest video had got 600,000 views if just one in 10,000 people if just one in 10,000 people saw that video and took objection to it and was motivated to start seriously abusing her online and threatening her etc just one in 10,000 that would still give you 60 highly motivated abusive individuals making threats imagine what that looks like 60 people threatening you with violence or threatening you with various different things and calling you all the fucking 
bastards under the sun. Imagine what that looks like. And that's just at the one in 10,000 level. And how can you, how can you infer anything about an entire group of people based on just one in 10,000 of them? That cannot be right to do. And yet many of these articles seem to draw these conclusions. Oh, this group of people must be a terrible group of people when you look at these kind of comments. And yet when you're talking about such huge numbers of viewers, really, you know, it, it's a very, very skewed way to look at things. But if you are one of those 10,000 or one of those one in a thousand or whatever the figures actually are that make these kind of threats and this horrible unwarranted abuse of individuals when it's the arguments uh, that are really the issue, then all I can say to you is as far as I'm concerned, you could be dying in the desert and I wouldn't piss in your mouth. That is the kind of low regard that I hold you in. I have absolutely no time for people like you. You are the absolute pits. And for those conspiracy theorist types who think, well, all this abuse, it's all fabricated, Jim. It's all made up. You know, they're, they're making up the abuse themselves, right? So so Mario Balotelli, the, the lazy footballer who lets down every single fucking team he ever plays for, right? And doesn't train very hard. All the abuse that he gets, then he makes it all up. Oh, Justin Bieber's abuse, he makes up. These software devs who make a slight tweak to some very popular game and then get a fucking torrent of abuse and threats, they're all making it up. You know, the point is... We all know this goes on. Why would people like Anita Sarkeesian make it up when they don't need to make it up? Sure, if you look at my lawn, if you go in my back lawn and there's lumps of shit all over it, you might, you might suspect that I've been shitting on my lawn, right? But if I owned a dog, right, you don't own a dog and shit on your own lawn. Why? Because you don't need to. That's a, maybe a slightly obscure argument there. If you own a dog, you don't need to shit on your own lawn, right? Anita Sarkeesian owns the dog here. She is going to get the abuse. She doesn't need to make the abuse up. If she does make the abuse up, well, that's fine. But she really won't need to. None of these people need to make the abuse up. I always find that a really, really strange argument to make. I wish I could say, look, wouldn't it be great for the abuse to stop? I can condemn the abuse. We can all condemn the abuse. But like I say, all it takes is one in 10,000 people to do it. And it still looks like an absolute fucking torrent of abuse. And what chance have I got? What chance have any of us got? At getting to that really hard line one in a thousand or one in ten thousand. Okay, well, that's pretty much all that I wanted to say. I may make a video about Anita Sarkeesian's uh, recent tropes video, but I'm going to watch it first, see if I've got anything to say about it, anything that I think is worth saying about it. If I do, I'll make that video. If I don't, I won't. Thank you for watching this video. Bye for now.